the Lord be with you. And with your spirit. A reading from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. The angel Gabriel was sent by God to a town in Galilee called Nazareth, to a virgin betrothed to a man named Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. He went in and said to her, Rejoice, so highly favored. The Lord is with you. She was deeply disturbed by these words and asked herself what this greeting could mean. But the angel said to her, Mary, do not be afraid. You have won God's favor. Listen, you are to conceive and bear a son, and you must name him Jesus. He will be great and will be called Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his ancestor David. He will rule over the house of Jacob forever, and his reign will have no end. Mary said to the angel, But how can this come about, since I am a virgin? The Holy Spirit will come upon you, the angel answered, and the power of the Most High will cover you with its shadow. And so the child will be holy and will be called Son of God. Know this too. Your kinswoman Elizabeth has, in her old age, herself conceived a son, and she, whom people called barren, is now in her sixth month, for nothing is impossible to God. I am the handmaid of the Lord, said Mary. Let what you have said be done to me. And the angel left her. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know about you, but I find waiting difficult. We're still waiting for Christmas, and we've got another five days to go. You know, we've always heard that patience is a virtue. It's a virtue that I often don't have. Waiting can be an incredibly stressful experience, which brings out the worst in us. Yeah, I'm a May. For Dill. Yeah. There is another kind of waiting, though, which is really difficult. For example, waiting in times of fear, confusion, or suffering. In these times, it is a waiting at a time in our life when the illusion of control has been removed from us. When we experience and feel our abject powerlessness. Perhaps it's concerning our health or the health of our loved one waiting for a diagnosis or, or waiting for results. It's difficult because we would do anything, but there is nothing we can do except for wait. And that's hard. Perhaps it's a, a decision that's going to impact in our lives, and the decision lies in the hands of someone else. And it's difficult to wait because we, we feel so powerless. Perhaps we're waiting for a relationship to heal. And we know that when it comes to relationships, when we try to meddle, we end up making things worse. What we have to do is wait, and that's difficult. 
in this time of waiting, we can often ask ourselves, where is God? At times like this, we can feel that he is not answering our prayers. I believe that all these difficulties of waiting are intensified this Advent. We all have experienced the uncertainty of what Christmas will look like this year. Is it on? Is it off? Who will we meet up with? Or perhaps even harder, who will we not be able to meet up with? This waiting experience reveals in us something that is lacking. And yet when we come to the Christmas season, we're all supposed to be happy, right? But what if I don't feel happy? Underneath that supposed happiness, there could be a lot of suffering, a deep down yearning within ourselves. In Advent, we discover that in our waiting, we can encounter God in a new way. That the very thing we long for is going to be fulfilled in the one whose birth we celebrate. Today we hear the great gospel, which is the prelude to the nativity events, where the angel Gabriel came to a people who had been waiting for centuries to be liberated. They had been waiting for the coming Messiah. The angel Gabriel came to this young girl and makes the most audacious proposal in the history of the universe. And the entire universe waits for her response. What is her response? Let what you have said be done to me. Which basically means yes. Many great people have reflected on this over the centuries. And they often use the Latin word fiat, let what you have said be done. It's not necessarily one of these. Mary's fiat was an act of trust, obedience, surrender of faith. It was an act of trust in God, obedience to what God was asking her to do, an act of total surrender in faith. Think about it. The most amazing thing of this gospel is that after the angel makes his announcement to Mary, she has only one question. I mean, I wouldn't know where to start with the questions. If I were in Mary's shoes, I would be asking things like, what, you want me to be pregnant before I'm married? In this society, what is Joseph going to think and say and do? What about my parents? How are they going to react? What will the people of my town do to me? You want me to carry this child prophecy? The child spoken of in our first reading today, the child who will fulfill the prophecy of the kingdom of David? What will this mean for my life? How am I going to do this? But she asks only one question, and then she says, yes. She is young and passionate about God. Don't you love people who are young and passionate about God? You know, the pastor Rick Warren says, Christians are like tea bags. You don't know what's inside until they get dropped in hot water. In a period of waiting in our lives, when we feel we have no control, when we feel powerless, when we are afraid and confused, well, that's a kind of hot water. And sometimes it's when we find out what's inside. That is where we're going to encounter the Lord in, a, in the, one of the most powerful ways. And that's what happened to Mary. So for us, Mary is a model for trusting God. She is the model disciple. I want now to look at four qualities of Mary that can help us to grow in trust of God. First of all, think eternally. 
Maybe she didn't have thousands of questions because she was thinking eternally. Certainly when the angel came to her, he spoke of eternal things. This son's kingdom would be an eternal kingdom. You know, our values and priorities are shaped by what we spend most time thinking about and desiring. Thinking eternally is such an important key to trust in God, to be at peace with God in times of difficulty. But if our entire focus is this world, this moment in life, we will never be able to think beyond these priorities which seem so important to us, but in the light of eternity, eternity, they will be absolutely unimportant. We need to put on the mind of Christ. And to do this, we need to engage with the Lord every day in prayer. We need to be informed by the Word of God, praying and studying the Scriptures. Recently, I heard praying the Scriptures being described as receiving communion in the Word of God. I think that's a lovely description. Secondly, let others speak into your life. The first thing Mary did after the angel's announcement was to go and visit Elizabeth, her cousin. Imagine their conversation as they shared their story. They experienced community. If we are going to grow in our trust in God, to allow the Lord to comfort us in these times of difficulty, we need to have a Christian community. People who know us and care for us and speak into our lives. That's why small groups are so important to us in these parishes. That's why we encourage you to join in one of our life groups. We want everybody to be part of a small group. You know, and these small communities become communities within the big community. You know, in a different time, if you were having a difficulty, you could call the priest. But in these times, for example, now in our own parish, where we have two parishes and one priest, the priest isn't always available. And perhaps he shouldn't always be available. Because the point is that we have to speak into one another's lives. That's why we have life groups. And I would encourage you, if you've not already plugged into one of our small groups, that as a gift to yourself this Christmas, you might want to join a life group. Or if you're not ready to start there, why not join us on the Alpha course? The third value, value obedience over convenience. When is obedience ever convenient? I mean, I mean if, it, if it was convenient, there would be no need for obedience. Today, the word obedience is a kind of bad word. In our second reading today, St. Paul writes to the Romans that the whole point of everything he writes is to bring about obedience of faith. Faith is not a feeling. It's not a disposition. It's rooted in obedience, which means that I am under God's Word, and I hear it and respond even when it's inconvenient. Look at the words of Mary. I am the handmaid of the Lord. You know that word handmaid really means servant. But don't we often say to God, I want you to be the servant of me. Let it be according to my word. The fourth attribute of Mary, which I think is important, is believe that trust brings the greatest joy. After Mary visited Elizabeth, she prayed a prayer we know as the Magnificat. We pray it every day in the church's evening prayer. 
My soul glorifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. The ultimate fruit of her yes, her letting it be, her obedience was joy. I can testify in my own life that the moments I have most surrendered to God, have been most obedient to God, is where I've experienced the greatest joy. In these grace-felt moments when I can be obedient, and I'm not always because like everyone else, I struggle with obedience, but in these moments of grace, I find the most joy. And do you know why this is? Because when we're being obedient to God, we find that we are where we are supposed to be. And that brings peaceful joy. And this joy is available to all of you.